Hold on to your hats. The countdown to the biggest wellness event of the year is on. Join our side August 15 and 16 in Melbourne for not one but two days of powerhouse wellness featuring 11 of Australia's most inspiring, entertaining, educating, fermentating speakers. Damo, what is fermentating? MP, I'll tell you at the summit. Your favourite wellness couch speakers are joined by special guest Nat Kringudis on all things hormones and female health. Join the Up For A Chat girls, the wellness guys, the natural nutritionist Steph Lowe, Kale Brock, Quirky Cookings, Joe Witt, Marcus Pierce, and the rest of your favourite wellness couch podcasters. Regular and VIP tickets are still available, but hurry before this summit is sold out. For tickets, go to www.thewellnesssummit.com. The Wellness Summit is proudly brought to you by Well & You. Be someone that makes you happy. wellnesscouch.com streaming wellness into your lives welcome to nourishing the mother featuring your hosts bridget wood and julie tenner hello and welcome to nourishing the mother i'm bridget wood i'm julie tenner and today we are exploring birth yes (laughs) <laughs> it's such a big topic for me and so close to my heart in so many ways that I almost feel like I don't even know how to start. Yeah, how do we this touch podcast. this one? I don't even know. I feel like for me, there's so many facets that go on when I think about what is what is the gift and the message that I would like to go out to the bigger world about birth. Yes. And for me, there's an emotional resonance about it, but there's also a physiological happening in how we deal with birth mm. in our Australian culture here yes. right now. So what are the tools that you need as a pregnant woman, particularly for first? time mothers Mm -hmm. so I feel like I kind of want to touch on both but perhaps we need to come back to the more um, emotional energetic properties of birth as a separate podcast but I still want to touch on them yeah we we can't kind of we kind of kind of we have to touch both because you cannot separate them (laughs) and I think perhaps we live in a culture that almost wants to separate them which is why we need to place the attention on this oh do you know what well said actually quite right so what I really want when I think about birth is I, and for all of my clients, and hopefully some of you are listening and have a very special place in my heart, I think about birth and I really want birth to be a process that begins at conception, possibly as we we're talking about in our infertility podcast, preconception. Mm. It is a journey of womanhood. It is a rite of passage. It is a transition into the new you. It's often a process of shedding stuff that we've harbored that we've held onto in our subconscious and from our family dynamics and from our belief systems and it really forces us and propels us to give birth to ourselves as a mother Mm. where which we've never done before and sometimes that's the even again as a mother of two or a mother of three is different each time you're giving birth to a new version of yourself and you're dealing with new issues each time you go through it and so it's a hugely emotional time it's a hugely cathartic process if you allow it and hugely healing if you Mm. allow it and it really allows you to tap into your really deep-seated femininity and your really deep-seated unconscious which is the part that i really love in these divine birthing goddesses it's primal isn't it yeah it strips us back from everything that we have ever built up to protect ourselves yes it really has Mm. So I, what I really want is for women to know that there's no judgment. It doesn't matter what type of birth you have in terms of if it's completely natural or it's completely an elective caesarean. Mm. For me, I want to look at it in terms of the woman and her journey. And if she's really listening to herself and allowing herself to journey and to to be the head of that process that therefore it's an empowered birth Mm. it doesn't necessarily matter and often we we look at the end point of birth as the result as the reason for it but for me the process of labor is so much about the process that the beauty and the glory in it is in the journey Mm. as opposed to what's happened at the very end of it The problem I see with our culture is so much birth trauma Mm. and birth trauma is really almost like a post-traumatic stress syndrome that I see in mothers' pregnancies later when they've had such traumatic experiences of being um, overrun, of put through a system, of being neglected, of um, things being done to them without Mm. their necessary um, consent and or the process going completely another direction that they don't have the support for that they were not aware of and that they don't know how to handle and where to put it Mm. and no one in our society gives voice to it because it gets swept away oh well 
that's all right, love, because you've got a healthy baby. Mm. So why do you need to even look at that stuff? Because it doesn't yeah, matter because you've got matter. the baby. Mm. But for that woman, it sits so deeply in her soul that unless it's given opportunity to speak its life, it's never going anywhere good. No. And that festers in that woman in her motherhood, in her connection to her child, in her parenting choices. Yes. And certainly in her sense of her connection to herself, to her deep sacred feminine, to her career, to her purpose, to her soul. I really see it playing out in women's lives in so many facets. So what I really want for women is empowered birth. I really want birth where they feel like a goddess and that everyone in that room sees them as a goddess. And it's honoring their choices. It is honoring the choices. And do you know how they do that is by knowing your choices to start off with. Yes, great segue. <laughs> so if you're informed about birth and culture, mm. then you're in a much better position than if you're just going along yes. for the ride. Yes. So actually, do you know what I'm going to read right now is a quote out of Rhea Dempsey's birth. So Rhea Dempsey is Australia's probably most well-known birth attendant. And I trained with her and she has a book out at the moment called Birth with Confidence. So she really talks about birth culture as it is now. And her main focus is on pain. Mm. So she really wants women to get real about pain and to figure out their tool systems for dealing with it as opposed to numbing it and drugging it or just pretending like it's not there or expecting that at some point they have a threshold independent of what's happening so she has these different archetypes or these different women at the point of labor that are going into it so she calls it the pain avoiding attitude these women take a proactive position proactive to avoid all pain in labor women who have this attitude hit a crisis of confidence so this is these moments in in birth where women hit often it's come after a flood of hormones and they've hit a point of their subconscious that's come up and all of a sudden the train wreck has happened they can't go on nothing's working and they will literally look for the weakest link in their inner circle which i really want to talk about the circles of influence in birth mm. and we expect in natural birth that you're going to hit a crisis of confidence and possibly now what we see in women these days is not just one where traditionally it would have happened at the point of transition when you move from from um, laboring in the cervix opening to pushing now we're seeing it happening way earlier in labor even in really early labor and at several points during the labor and for me i really look forward to these moments and i educate my clients on them really in depth to expect them and to give themselves tools and resources for dealing with them because this is your window into the subconscious this is mm. the part of birth where you can't escape it because you are literally living in it yes, which never it happens at yeah. any other point in our life we never have such direct access to our subconscious as we do in birth and that's a gift because if we're given the right support at the right time with the right tools and the right message we can heal years of trauma in quite seriously minutes. I ripped up. I feel ripped up. I didn't know this. I know. <laughs> I know. And can I tell you the gloriousness of watching a woman hit a crisis of confidence? And if she didn't have an external support person to her husband, her husband generally is what I've seen would just crumble because he loves this woman mm. so deeply. And what she's what he's seeing externally is her physical manifestation of pain. So she's in so much pain and she can't cope and the whole world's falling apart and she can't do this shit and she's checking out of here and give me the whatever and yeah. all the hate and the anger and the pain and the anguish starts coming out. But usually this is coming down to a point of the subconscious. It's inner child work, something they haven't healed part of their, yeah. part of their process. And if you've got, if you know that woman really deeply, if you've already talked about a skill set for dealing with that, it is the sweetest healing you've ever and seen. And how beautiful, can I just interject, would it be to have a doula or somebody skilled in this to help you unpack what was happening oh, in the amazing. birth to help you heal it even further? It's amazing. It really is amazing. That is such a powerful thing. It's really powerful. Mm. And that changes those women's lives moving forward because yeah. not only have they eliminated stuff they've been holding on to for potentially their whole lives, but they also have an in-practice tool set for dealing with any type of pain, emotional pain, physical pain, psychological pain. They actually have the same skill set and they've seen it work. They've felt it work and they've shifted stuff. And the people around them, like their intimate partners who hold their space most of the time, have the direct tool set, the skills for dealing mm. with it, which otherwise are not things that we generally are vulnerable enough to discuss. Yes. So the healing that ripples out from that is actually incredibly profound. So generally what's happened, women hit these crises of confidence. They are going to look for the weakest link. So you don't put a weak link in your intimate circle. And we'll talk mm. about that later. And then you know what happens? They move through it. Mm. And then they're back into laboring goddess 
able to breathe and move through it and it's all really cool and yeah. I, can, I can do this shit again. Yeah. And I kind of think it's such a shame because in this world, in this birthing culture, we get stuck at the start of the crisis of confidence. We mm. don't see the blessings and the gifts in no. moving through that emotion, well, what I see is emotional pain in a physical manifestation. Yeah. yeah. Because when you move through it, they're back on board again. Yeah, it was, it was just really that moment. It was support through that moment or yes. those moments. Yeah, because I, 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 I was totally taken there. When you are explaining that, I was totally taken there. Were you? In, in your... my own birth. Yeah, yeah. Or in, in my birth of my son. Yeah. And absolutely. what did you experience in that moment? Massive fear of his death. Wow. Massive fear of his death. And not which trusting. Which comes about from your previous pregnancy, which would have been the miscarriage. Yeah, yeah. possibly. Yeah. yeah. And I had to keep the, I had to get the midwives to keep checking if he was okay. I got like I couldn't trust myself. I, and so you had your mother and your my mother, husband and my husband. There. Yeah. And so and were either do you have a recollections, emotional recollections of your space being held or of you being? No, I, well, I actually think because my mum towards the end because I I had a um, I was really intentional with my birth and we trained in calm birth and I had no drugs and I was very present. Um, and but my mum, I remember towards the end was almost kind of like looking at the doctor, going, "Quick, you know, go and do, go and take her to have a Caesar." Like my mum was not, mm. she was not probably the best person to have in that room because I think she was just as much, it's just anxious for my, about my safety. You know, she'd see me pushing for two hours. I was very, very big. Like I had, I found out I had nine pound seven baby. Like I, I didn't know, I didn't know that I was going to be birthing a baby like that which obviously doesn't matter sometimes but you know I guess yeah. it did matter for me first time as well is a big difference yeah and um and yes I don't know that energetically she was the strongest mm. person to have in that room then um which potentially was also impacting me energetically which is all so you don't I, have a recollection of feeling angry or upset or no lost. no and in fact the doctor come back came the next day and said that um I was enormously calm Wow. You know, that I was incredibly... But that's not what's happening internal to no, you. No, not at all. Not yeah. happening internally. Internally, it was like, I remember saying to myself over and over, this too shall pass, this too shall pass, this too shall pass. I was saying to myself over and over again. and But really having that intense fear of, you know, like, and looking outside of myself, I, I was not able to trust. Yeah. Because birth is just such a huge... Um, it requires so much of us to trust, you know, and to really to surrender to, to and to go. surrender. Yes, you it know, does. It's but you know what else I find fascinating about that story is if you were my client, I would be looking at you going, okay, but that's your fallback mechanism. You're shut down and not really being totally vulnerable and speaking your truth to those around you. Even the people you deeply love mm. is your fallback mechanism. That's your protection. So this is the woman who, you know, is having this deep pain, mm. emotional, let's say, pick any moment that you've had a deep emotional pain or hurt in your life. And what she really deeply in her heart and in her womb and in her soul wants is just to be held, held through her thrashing, held through her hating, held through her tears, held through whatever, told that she's loved and adored, followed like a puppy dog around the room. But what she does is hand up, just leave me alone, I'll be fine, I'll sort myself out, and takes herself to the bedroom and closes the door. Mm. And then she comes back out and everything's fine All again. All composed again. Yeah. But that's not going to cut it in labour because if you can't reach out and let someone know what's happening internally, mm. they can't help you with it. Mm. So this is also about knowing your stuff. Yes being real about it and the most important key is being vulnerable because it's incredibly difficult to mm. be courageous enough mm. to speak from such a deep place of truth and vulnerability that even though I say and do this what I really want and want to hear and want to feel is this mm. wow that's really hard to do I think I just, I clearly internalized so much. I mean, I, I got the birth that I wanted in inverted commas, but, yeah. and it was hugely, hugely. But the thing is you went through a process to get there. Yeah. So even though you're saying you still got the birth, you went through what, two and a half hours of pushing. I was in labor 13 hours and then, but yeah, two and a half hours of, of, of intense yes. like pushing. Yeah. So that in itself is an internalization of that process in a mm. physical form. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Does that resonate for you? No, no, I don't really know that. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> didn't have I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to nod. <laughs> if you can see us right now, I'm kind of like nodding, but not really getting it. So that's <laughs> explained it for all of us. <laughs> what I'm meaning is where we see stallings, let's say, in labor. So labor that starts and stops, 
pushing that goes on for a really long time yeah a cervix that won't dilate there's a holding on emotionally of yes. some sort and i definitely knew that there was yes so that's more what i was okay, right, okay. so you're going well yeah i had that stuff but then i got through it in the anyway because i had this great birth and you did but i wonder would that process have been shorter as in the pushing process yeah. had you been able to physically get that out yes like like let go yeah like, truly let go and release. be held be held yeah i don't know i'm throwing it out there yeah no but that's really really like i love that we're unpacking this right <laughs> right here right now thanks everyone for listening all right i'm going back to rita so yes. these i think these are really interesting types to kind of because you hear so much about this with particularly first time moms particularly in your yeah potentially your work circles as well i think so pain avoiding wants nothing to do with it doesn't want to know about it. The minute anything, probably they're not even going to hit labor. They're having elective, elective cesarean. There's nothing mm. going on. It's completely pain avoiding. Um, then we have the status quo attitude. So these women take an acquiescent position, acquiescent to the dominant culture and medical messages. They are acquiescent to anyone they perceive as an expert. They're caregivers, neighbors, friends, etc. Just about anybody really. With this trusting acquiescence, the issue of pain management choices is shaped by whatever advice is offered. So they completely hand over their power on a platter. Yeah. Whoever is around them, and it doesn't even have to be a medical person, knows better than them. Mm. And so this completely shapes and changes the way that this woman gives birth, mm. particularly who her intimate support circle is and where she chooses to give birth. Then we have the wait and see attitude. These women have a wavering position. They have some yearning for normal physiological birth. And although they have a sense that there may be a way to work with the physiological pain, they also sense the enormity of the challenge. So they hedge their bets. The wait and see woman's attitude is underpinned, like many other women's, by a belief that pain thresholds are set at a particular point. A woman in this group doesn't realize that her pain tolerance can be influenced up or down by many factors, including the type of support she receives. Her attitude runs something like this. You know, when I've been giving birth forever, goes way back, can't be that bad. So I'm going to go for it. But then I've heard that these hormones can help. But then on the other hand, I've heard these stories and maybe it's not so easy. I think I've got a good pain threshold, but I'm not really sure. So I'm just going to wait and see. Hmm. So that's really interesting, isn't it? And yeah. then we have the aspirational but naive attitude. These women take a proactive stance based on their personal power. They are actively preparing for the birth. They've done their homework. They are willing women. They expect a normal physiological birth. And they may even have made some wise choices. But they are naive about the realities of the system. They're the realities of the pressure from the circles of influence and about the potency of pain and pain dynamics in labor. This was me. Mm, this mm -hmm. is me with my first two. The aspirational but naive woman is motivated by normal physiological birth, but is unrealistic regarding the challenge. She is, she is self-reliant, into self-control, and may buy into the pain-free story offered by some birth preparation techniques. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a tickly throat, which is funny. <coughs> that's um that's so that, that, i love reading these archetypes because you can so clearly see yourself in them and i know i'm definitely in that last one mm -hmm. um where i thought you know yeah i've got this you know like i've done all the reading so i'm gonna do it yeah this is actually like i love calm birth and hypno birth and all of the tools and the skills and the normality of birth that, that provides yes but often what i've seen out of these clients that i've had that have really set everything they've got into this one one dynamic of birth and how mm. to handle it is that they don't expect pain yeah so if they experience any type of pain then they've failed they haven't done it right yeah wow okay and so then the whole birth comes crashing down around them yes okay so <clears throat> she is in denial about crisis vulnerabilities because she believes they're never going to happen to her because of this she doesn't pay attention to the need of experienced support Finally, she sees overcoming the pain as a mark of her sense of self and her expression of her personal power. Still sound like you. Yeah, still sounds like me. <laughs> then lastly, we have the pain embracing attitude. These women take a proactive stance based on their personal power, enhanced by experienced support. These women are willing women, savvy willing women. They are highly motivated toward normal physiological birth and they know that pain is in its territory. Pain is its territory. They understand that pain is power, not only physically, but also in the power play that surrounds a birthing woman. They accept the challenge of, 
challenge of embracing the intensity, conscious of the enormity of the task. They understand the lessons from the circle of influence, which we'll talk about, and have made wise choices about their birthplace culture and their facilitating holding circle. They have reflected on the physiological and psychological impact of their pain dynamics and how these might manifest in their particular story and have prepared themselves and strengthened their birth circles accordingly. Mm. So in the birth culture that we have at the moment, there in Victoria, we're talking about Victoria, Australia, only 3% of women have a completely natural physiological birth. Mm. That is just, and I know like there's even, it's even difficult to get studies of the impact of normal physiological birth because the population is so small as you say three percent three percent that's an extraordinary figure when you think about all of our friends and um every woman we love in our lives mm. entering this place thinking i've got the best um you know ob i've got the best hospital i'm going to the this and the that only three percent are gonna make it it's incredible. Those stats are just incredible. So there's a system that goes along with that, isn't there? So what we're talking about with this, the, what we're talks about is a circle of influence is it's talking about the wider circle from you. So what influences your perception of birth mm. and what influences your ability to have a physiological normal birth. Yes. So she's talking about wide culture, where have you come from, family beliefs, um, your own birth. Then we're talking about beliefs around you of friends, of stories, of how much you know physiologically about your body and birth itself. Then we're talking about belief systems. Then we're talking more intimately about your mother's perception of birth. So mm. there's, a, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting a tickly throat. There's a um, statistic that's bounced around in birth circles that if we choose to birth unconsciously, as in we do no conscious work to improve our birth outcomes, let's yes. say, that we are 80% predetermined to birth ourselves, wow. given that we repeat the birth that we had. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm. So the way that our mothers birthed us, yes. if we do no work on, is the way that we will birth. So that's so funny because I was born by faucet delivery for my mum and... and Hugo, like I obviously had some resistance to deliver him and I had an mm. episiotomy. So it's an improvement. I did a bit of work. Totally. <laughs> totally. I hear that. Yeah, yeah. But this is often when you see generationally, oh, my mother's mother had a cesarean and my mother had a cesarean and now I've had a cesarean. Yeah. It's probably just our hips. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy. It's, it's, it's an easy one to explain away, isn't it? <laughs> so it's really, I find that absolutely fascinating. Yes. And so then more intimately, she talks about what is the place of birth that you've chosen? Mm. Because the place you birth your child, a private hospital, a public hospital, a birth center, or at home is going to completely change your outcomes. So mm. statistically, so I'm going to run you through a list of questions that you need to ask, but that is definitely the place of birth has policies and viewpoints and procedures and a way of viewing women in labor that will change your outcome for sure. Mm. Then more intimately, you have what we call your intimate holding circle. So these are the people that are really physically there with you during the labor and birth process that are really working with you. And I think that largely women miss the point when they're hiring private obstetricians. So they're paying these private obstetricians thousands of dollars because they seem to represent this amazing birth experience. But the hard part of labor that determines your birth is the labor process. Mm. And the obstetrician is not there for that. The obstetrician is there at the point of birth, not in the labor, but it's mm. the labor that determines the birth that you have. Yes. It's the labor where you delve into the unconscious and it's the labor that you need the help and support and the love. So putting your resources, both financial and emotional into your labor is going to serve you far better at your birth than if you just focus on the birth. I love you. I've never heard it explained like that, and that is just such a beautiful way to explain it because it's so it's so true, isn't it? It really it's it's about concentrating those resources around the time when you are most vulnerable and that you most need that support and love, and that That's is exactly labor, right. and then that is the preparation for labor, which you know having on your birth team a doula or a private midwife who's able to explore what's going to come up for you emotionally in your unconscious is you know such a huge part of the piece of the puzzle you know so much more in my view than the kind of the hearing your baby's heartbeat and the measure of your stomach yes. you know at, the, at your 15 minute appointment with your obstetrician once a month or whenever that is oh my gosh 
the way that you can experience as a woman being held by another woman, mm. even in your pregnancy, that like an independent midwife or a doula will spend an hour or more just sitting with you, being with you, That's connecting amazing. with you, listening to your story, to your psychology, to your past, mm. to your trauma, to all the things that you need to birth the way that you need to birth. And your obstetrician will do 10 minutes in, you're out, you've got your measurements, you've got your weight, you've got your check you later. And I kind of think we are missing oh. the gloriousness and the juiciness of womanhood. And that's what that I, process. and I absolutely really felt that. Like I used to leave my appointments with my GP obstetrician, who was a woman and she was fantastic. But I was kind of like, oh, is that it? You know, what about this whole other part of me that and I'm journeying? And this is what I hear. Women are like, I, I think I want more, but I, just, yeah. I can't figure out tangibly what that more is. No, and It's and, a deep yearning for it though. Yeah. And, but in mainstream sort of circles, you don't really know that there is any other way. Mm. You know, it's, it's very, you know, if you've kind of been operating from that very mainstream way of thinking, you often haven't even heard of what doula is. It's so you true. Know, I, I don't think I had. Yes. Doula is just a Greek word. Yeah. It means being with woman. So it's traditionally, you know, your lay midwives mm. that really have the, sc the skills and the tools for emotionally and physically getting a woman through labor. So a midwife mm. is fantastic at looking at the baby and what's going on with, generally, and we're not talking about independent midwives, let's say your mainstream midwives are mm. gonna come across in, in mainstream hospitals, really good at abnormality of birth, what's happening with the baby, what's happening with this process, and how can we medically have a menu of things to offer a change to this. Mm. But those really gorgeous independent midwives, doulas that really are with women are looking really more deeply at what are her instincts, what is her birthing process, and how can I hold and nourish that space. Wow, so I really feel like there is such a wealth of knowledge here and so much to unpack that we're going to have to do this over two episodes. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a great idea to split it up and maybe we do a few how-tos now and maybe jump back to the 10 questions. And I really yes. think open up a lot of stuff for particularly new clients that I've had. And then we come back and really talk about the unfolding of the inner circle and how that gets you through mm. the more psychological dynamics of birth and birth trauma that really psychological headspace maybe is part two yeah i think that'd be a really great way to illustrate it so perhaps let's go through those 10 questions and then in the next episode we'll get some you know real stories from some of yeah. those experiences great sounds good to me so 10 questions on my website i have lots of information which is naturopathicbirth.com.au so please have a look at that but i'm going to run through one of the sheets i have on there that i give all of my clients when they're in the process or even if they've rung up and they want to check something is 10 questions to really ask your caregiver it doesn't matter who you've chosen a private obstetrician a midwife a hospital a home birth, whatever you've chosen, these are 10 questions to ask to really inform you about what choice it is that you're making. And I think these questions open up a lot of more questions for those women that I've come in contact with. So I really want to just quickly hash those out with you. So if you're looking at a particular caregiver or a private obstetrician, what hospitals do they work out of? Go and visit them. See if you feel good, see if you feel comfortable, visit the labour room, see if you like their facilities, see if you feel comfortable in the rooms in which you labour because different hospitals have very different spaces in, in what you're labouring in. It's got nothing to do with their food facilities and their cafe. I'm really talking about how you feel in that space. How much does it feel like you could relax and be naked and be carefree and really be who you need or feel that you want to be in that space. What are the hospital policies on monitoring induction and water birth, if that's something that you're wanting to look at? All hospitals have a set of policies and procedures that they adhere to. It's really important that you get incredibly clear on what type of birth you want and if your particular setting can cater for that. And they will literally have policies. So policies on monitoring might be the minute you get in, they require a 20-minute trace where the baby's got to have these signs and any time that the belt slips off or something changes, that 20 minutes starts again. So I've had lots of women that have said, you know, I got into hospital and I was flat on my back on the bed for an hour and a half because it kept slipping off and we couldn't get a proper 20 minute trace or they just left me and forgot about me. And the da -la 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 -la. So you need to be really clear on what the monitoring is. If your waters are broken, is the monitoring different? If you've got meconium in the waters, is the monitoring requirements different? What is it that you can actually do with each of those? And by asking that question, you'll receive lots of information. 
what is the induction policy and procedure? So how long past your due date in commas does that caregiving setting let you go? So you want to know that stuff too. And can you actually have a water birth? So there's very few hospitals in certainly Melbourne, Victoria here where you can actually literally give birth to a baby in water. Most hospitals will have the ability to use water in labor in the sense of they may have, depending on where you are, they may have a bath in your room, but more likely they've got one bath that is shared by the entire labor ward. So you really want to know what are the chances. Then beyond that, they have, well, you can only be in that if we have a midwife who's trained in that on duty at that time. Mm -hmm. So it's hit and miss again, you're not guaranteed it. And beyond that, well, you can labor in the water, but the second you start pushing, you have to get out of that bath because we're not liable for you giving birth in water. Mm. So if you want particular birth, you have to really honestly have the balls to ask the questions before you arrive there. I've had plenty of clients who go, oh no, look, I didn't get to ask. Oh no, I didn't say that. No, I don't think I could. Oh, just wait and see. Yeah. And the thing is, it's too late. If you're not brave enough to have those discussions when you're not in labor, it's not going to happen when you're there. Mm. You've Mm. got to be really clear. And if you've hired a private obstetrician, let me tell you, your private obstetricians, policies and procedures and guidelines and how they want to stretch all of those rules overrule the hospital set of policies and guidelines. So Mm. this is where you have got absolute gold if you've got a private obstetrician. If you have had all of these conversations with your private obstetrician and you have honed in exactly what you can and can't do, what they will or won't let you do, and you've got that written down, then when you get there, whatever midwife is on duty and says, no, we don't do that in this hospital, you can say, well, then I'd like you to ring my obstetrician because I've already had this conversation with them Mm. and they've already said that they'll do this. That's great advice. It's Oh Mm. my gosh. Don't forget the power and the money that you have paid if you've gone down the path of a private obstetrician because they whatever they say is what that hospital slash midwives are required mm. to do. Mm. But you have to have had those conversations before you get there. And I guess sometimes too, some some women might have a you know be afraid to have those conversations in case your obstetrician won't be supportive. Yes, because do you want to know? Yeah. But I've had plenty of women who you know I've had a couple that haven't had those conversations and then they've got to the point of pushing in the bath and the midwife's telling them to get out and they say, I'm not getting out. And look, I go at that two different ways. Sometimes they can get their way, but it creates such turmoil mm. turmoil in that moment and such conflict and butting of heads when what you really want is the opposite of that. Yeah. But it's just not a nice energy to be birthing in. Yes. Whereas if you've already cleared all of that with your obstetrician, you're very comfortable in what your options are. You already know your choices and you can just be free to roll with those. Mm, mm. So I really want you to do that. What are the hospital statistics for natural birth, C-section, epidural, episiotomy, and induction? So every hospital has a set of statistics on what their outcomes are based across every single birth that they've had. And some hospitals will have a 55% C-section rate and an 86% induction rate and a whatever. And if you're after a really natural birth, you're not going to get it in a hospital that has really high statistics mm. on any of those interventions. But if you're choosing a hospital that has, you know, a 30% or lower C-section rate and a 12% or lower, I'm pulling these figures out, whatever the rates are, the lower the rates of those things that you're wanting to avoid are, the better your chances are of not having them. Yeah. So it's really worthwhile getting the hospital statistics and also individual private obstetricians will have their own set of statistics. So it's worth asking them too. Because I've had a lot of clients whose hospitals and private OBs will sit there and go, yes, 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 yes. And it's all very easy to say yes, 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 until you get there and you're in the moment and they go, oh, yeah, look, probably not. And I think that that's a reflection too of, you know, perhaps some caregivers in some ways knowing that there's going to be that vulnerability in that moment that's going to be very easy to override. Yes, because there's all these extenuating factors, isn't there? So you've got to be really savvy and really informed. Are sterile water injections an option? So if you haven't heard of those before, it's usually performed by a midwife, usually two at the same time, usually into different points, and they will inject sterile water into your back, really just where your sacrum is, where often if you've got a a labor with a lot of back pain is where you're going to feel it. And the back pain in those sorts of posterior type of labors where the baby's head's just kind of jamming on um, 
your back creates such enormous pain that women literally can't even feel the cervix pain. So the pain that most women mm. complain about in, in labor, can't even feel it. That's how intense their back the pain is. is. And so you have sterile water, inje- water injections just under the skin. They do it during a contraction because it stings to absolute buggery like a bee sting. But what it does is it, it um, interferes with the nerve endings. So it completely, for probably about two hours, eliminates that back pain. Mm. I can't, and that's a drug-free intervention. And what about, I mean, for me, I use a TENS machine, which is a similar... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so TENS machine, really, you need to use at the start of labor. It's mm. not going to do you any good if you bring it in once things get yeah. hard. Yeah. You have to have already had that um, neural programming, I suppose, right at the beginning. And it's hit and miss. Some women find it irritating. Some women find it absolute godsend. And yes. again, it's, it's, you take everything, don't you? I mean, I kind of go... Why not just do it all and take it there? Because you can't find it once you're in the space. And you get this one opportunity, this one time to have this incredible experience, whatever it is. So why not throw everything at it that you possibly can? I certainly would. Um, So water injections isn't an option. What, oh, I said that's uh, obstetric statistics for natural birth, C-section, epidural, episiotomy, and induction. What are the monitoring and internal vagina exam requirements? They vary on caregiver to caregiver and they give on they change on place to birth. So um, what is actually the the bare minimum that they require in order for you to, to in commas be normal, be happy, be meeting their requirements? And do you want those? Because you certainly don't have to consent to any of those things, but you really want to be informed about what it is that they require so that you have room to move within that. Um, how long are they comfortable with you, uh, with giving you, hang on, how long are they comfortable with giving you to go into labor naturally? If your waters broke with no labor, how many hours, how many days? So sometimes rarely some women's, and I find that women generally, if they've never had babies before, have no idea about when the waters break. In a really textbook labor, your waters would break when you're moving into transition. So when your cervix is really open, so between 8 and 10 centimeters, that baby's really starting to come through the pelvis and you're about to start pushing is generally when the pressure builds enough that the waters break. But there are women who have their babies, and I did with my second baby, whose waters don't break and their babies literally come out in the call in the sack. And I've had women whose waters have broken days, sometimes even weeks before they've even gone into Mm. labor. So you really want to think about once the waters break, it's it no longer is a sterile environment because you now have an opening to the world, yes. I suppose. So that changes the way that hospitals and obstetricians will then view you. So you really want to know what um, your time frames are to work with before mm. they want to start doing things to you, such as induction and moving forwards. How long past the due date are, you, are they comfortable with you going without you going into labour before induction? What are their recommendations? Is water birth an op- option with your obstetrician or your midwife, which we talked about earlier? Um, how is oh, I've done that. What are the timings for their comfort zones for first stage, second stage, and third stage? So again, this is something that most women I find don't know about. First stage of labor means from the very first sign of labor through to your cervix being fully dilated at 10 centimeters. Second stage of labor is from the point of full dilation to the point of the baby being born. So it's all about the pushing and the baby coming through. The third stage of labor is the birth of the placenta. So when you remember there's three stages when we're talking about it and every single caregiver, obstetrician and um, place of birth, hospital setting has their own timelines on what they will in commas allow you to do. So they'll say first stage, we allow you 11 hours. And it doesn't matter at what stage in your labor you're opting in. As soon as you check into that hospital, Mm -hmm. that clock has started. So 11 hours will click over. And regardless of how you've progressed, what's going on in your body, la 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 la. And this concept just absolutely blows my mind. And I didn't know about this until after I'd had my son. But that's Mm. why it's so important to get comfortable with laboring at home. Yes, it is. Mm. And that's also when, again, in the next one we talk about a support circle is so important Mm. because the better your support circle and the better your knowledge, the longer you're willing to stay at home in the early labor stages. Mm. Because we certainly know that the earlier you enter the hospital system, the higher your rates of intervention are and the higher rates of your C-section are. And partly that's to do with those timing policies that they go, once you've clicked over the 11 hours, the 13 hours, whatever it is that your care setting is comfortable with, you're no longer considered a normal labor. Mm -hmm. You've now moved into an abnormal labor and therefore there's a different set of policies and procedures that apply to you. So what is the stretching of those timelines for first stage cervix dilation, second stage for pushing? Pushing is a really big one because now pushing, we look back when I had my 
my first child, it was normal for a first time mum to be pushing for about two and a half hours. Because once you've gone through the process of labor where your cervix is opening, it's this big opening, stretching feeling to all of a sudden your world changes and all of a sudden you're pushing and it's irresistible. And it's kind of like having barley belly, but with constipation, it takes you probably half an hour, I reckon most women to get their heads around that change in feeling and that change in energy. And they're really not doing even proper pushing for that Mm. first half hour. They're just getting used to that shift. And then they probably start to figure out how to push because they've never done it before for first time mums. Mm. And then after that, so I reckon probably after the first hour is really when you start doing your proper pushing. But most hospital settings will give you about 45 minutes to get your baby out. So the minute they go, and it doesn't matter if you've had an epidural and you can't feel anything the minute, they check you and you go, you're fully dilated. That clock is on for second stage. Yeah. So they want your baby out within 45 minutes. This is lots of hugely active pushing. This is when we have lots of problems and then we need to do things like forceps, episiotomies, mm. um, ventus, la 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 because the baby's not coming out fast enough. Yeah. Instead of working with the woman and her body, it's a very different way of looking at it. Mm. So when I had my first baby, it was about two and a half hours for a normal first-time mum to be pushing. I would say that that's pretty normal. If the baby's coping well and if mum's coping well and if she's got some beautiful support to help her mm. push in a really effective way, mm. and that doesn't mean like you see it on the TV. So, and third stage is once the baby's been born, how long are they comfortable with leaving it before the placenta comes out? Most times now without, because third stage seems to be something most women don't talk about. Mm. So it's very medicalized. It's incredibly rare now that you will get a really natural third stage, which is a delivery of placenta without any injections. I think that that the the numbers are so small now that there's actually no control to be able to do any no, studies it's on very that very Yeah. So if you want a natural delivery of your placenta, a natural flood of those hormones and that natural physiological birth process, you have to be savvy enough to know that beforehand, to have had those conversations, to have walked into the hospital with people knowing that, and for your care support around you at that time to remind those people mm. around you. Because it's so, it's such a, um, you know, one then the other thing now, baby's out, bang, injection, placenta, cut like it's just it's so fast and that obstetrician wants to be at that door in five minutes time Mm. thanks very much and you know even i think you know the the midwives you know to in respect to them too it's just become the way of things and so they're not they're not questioning it it's funny and no one's trained in anymore so it becomes that area of no one knows anymore so what are you comfortable with because if you've never seen it and you've never been trained in it you're not comfortable when you're not going to question it no you're not that's what so you need lots of research for third stage and definitely someone who's going to support that if that's the way that you are headed Are they willing to coach you through pushing to avoid a tear? So a lot of the women that I know get really worried about tearing and I versus also episiotomy. And I spend a lot of time telling them, but if you have a really good support team and you have a beautiful midwife or obstetrician who knows how to work with your body, who knows how to talk you through when to breathe and how to breathe Mm. and when to stop and how to gently stretch that perineum as things are happening you don't tear. Mm. I have had three babies and I haven't torn, but yeah. I have had beautiful support. And also it's so much about your own intention and your own fears and being aware of your own stuff that might be coming up. Of course up, it is. Up oh my gosh, of course it is. And that's what, well, what that's we want what, to pull apart. And that's yes. what you will have been working through yes. in the lead up to the birth. Yes. Know, to be really going into some of those places. Do you have any more on your list? Um, just one more. Will they support waiting for the cord to stop pulsating before it's cut? This is, again, part back to third stage. So assuming labor has been uncomplicated and the baby's been really well and you've had no interventions, I really want to encourage you to think about before the cord is even cut of the placenta um, to allow the cord to finish pulsating. So there's about a third of the baby's blood volume is stored in the placenta at the point of birth. So the cord still pulsates like a um, heartbeat and pushes all of those nutrients and all of those those birth hormones, we call them the birth cocktail for the baby and all of that blood supply back in. And it usually is done and dusted. That cord is flaccid and wide and not pulsating anymore within five minutes. Mm. So if you can delay your obstetrician and your care team from cutting that cord for the first five minutes, your baby has the most extraordinary start to life. And there should be a bit more um, kind of willingness to implement that now. I know that there's been a big change in the UK around them getting some 
um, regulations passed through some work a midwife was doing. Mm. So I think that's going to have to filter through into our system here. I'm just thinking about the woman listening to this who is 12, 24, 30-something <laughs> weeks pregnant with her first baby who is mildly freaking out right now oh. in terms of all of these. You I know, don't want you to freak out. I just want to open up your possibilities for questions. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's one thing that those women can take away to sit with and explore? You know, maybe it might not be that they're going to be able to tackle that whole mm. plethora yeah, fair of, enough. of questions. And so um, because, because, think, because really it's about empowering women in whatever birth that they have yes, to yes. feel like that it was their birth and that they had a choice. And what do you find the women that you've worked with, what is, gives them the strongest sense that they've had a choice or that they've been listened to? What's one of the mm-hmm. easier things to tackle with a care provider to, because really it, it, I guess it comes down to the individual woman and what her objectives are, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, initiating breastfeeding. So what does she need to do beforehand to really give her, yeah. you know, that opportunity what would you say to someone who's feeling overwhelmed right now? I would say do a birth plan. I have had plenty of obstetricians laugh in my face. I've had plenty of women say, what's the point in a birth plan? Because a birth never goes to plan. <laughs> I just go, no, it doesn't. And that's why you have plan A, B like, and C. Yeah. You have plan A for your perfect birth and you have to see it in your head. You have to visualize your perfect birth in your head to be able to write it down. Mm. And then you have plan B. So if plan A doesn't quite go to plan and therefore I'm having interventions that might be in the form of drugs, episiotomies, monitoring, whatever it is, then how am I going to handle each of those things? because you need the information so that you're not struggling in the moment. You want to be pre-prepared just to be able to move with it and still have a plan that works Mm -hmm. so that everybody around you knows how to support you and that you don't feel like things are done to you and over the top of you rather than you knowing and being part of that choice process. Mm -hmm. And plan C would be in the case of a Caesar. So there's a way to have a really beautiful Caesar Mm -hmm. and there's a way that it's just done as a procedure within a hospital. And I would really love women to have the empowerment to have a beautiful Caesar because I have seen them and they are divine. But you have to know how to work that system. Um, So I think that would be, please do a birth plan, please. Yes. And so that that we're not leaving you for another week with that hanging, I'm really great. I'm really glad that we sort of, you know, Got, got clear on that and, and have that conversation, first of all, about whether or not your care provider is willing for you to have a birth plan because mm. there are also a lot who won't work with that and I guess that's a red flag to you know perhaps explore more and, and certainly get in touch um, with Jules if you've got any concerns or something that you want a bit of help with, I think. Yeah, definitely. I'm more than happy to even help you put together your birth plan, think about your choices and your options. Mm. Absolutely. I want every woman to have an empowered, beautiful birth yeah. that they walk out of going, I am ready to be a mother and I'm feeling amazing and in my instincts and in my power to nourish this soul. That's what a birth is. That's beautiful. It's birthing the baby and birthing the mother. It is. Mm. So until next week, um, if you want to get in contact with us or give us some feedback on the show, we'd love to hear it. Um, And also give us a rating on iTunes. Um, We are at Nourishing the Mother on Facebook and also Julie is at naturopathicbirth.com.au and I'm at suburbansandcastles.com. Thank you. Thanks. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.